Before we get moving on today's episode, just a quick disclaimer. The views expressed on this podcast by either myself, my co-host, or any guests are their personal views and do not represent the views of any associated organization. Nothing in the episode should be construed or relied upon as financial, technical, tax, legal, or any other advice. Okay, let's jump into the episode. All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of Lightspeed. We've got a roundup today with Mert and myself. Lots to talk about in Solana land. So I've been uh, messing around on chain more than I should have. Don't tell my bosses. But nonetheless, man, landing a transaction has gotten brutal. Uh, We talked last week pretty in depth about failed transactions and dropped transactions as well. So if you need a primer, I recommend listening to the first half of last week's episode. Uh, But what I've noticed actually is the percentage of my transactions that don't go through that are dropped transactions rather than failing has actually increased. And in my opinion, that's probably like a worse user experience than just a failed transaction because uh, I would classify myself as like a more sophisticated user. And when I'm like doing an action such as trading a shit coin, low liquidity, low slippage, I'm sort of expecting that transaction to fail. Um, but when I'm like sending, you know, USDC or soul to a different wallet and the transaction like, the the loading wheel in my phantom wallet just spins and spins and spins and then the transaction just like disappears uh even that like bewilders me a little bit so uh you being an rpc provider i want to get your take on all this i mean the you uh rpcs are not the problem really here but i i want to get your take on on the drop transaction side of things and again i know we touched heavily on the, the failed side but why are transactions dropping yeah so 100 percent Drop transactions are a worse experience than a failed transaction because a failed transaction gives you some feedback and is actually on chain. Uh, and it's generally due to some application level problem and not actually a network problem. Drop transactions are a network problem. So those are important to distinguish. People like trolling me for that essay I wrote about what a failed transaction means, but it's actually quite important to understand what it is so that it's properly defined and you can reason about it. Otherwise, you can't fix the problem uh, or infer data properly. And if you can't infer data properly, everybody's just talking nonsense. Um, okay, so drop transactions. This happens because the TLDR is the networking stack of Solana is not good. Okay. Uh, Solana used to have a big spam problem, which would bring... Let me jump in there. Can you define networking stack for the for the average listener? Yeah. Um, so this is... I'm talking about literally the bare metal uh, inner workings of the internet where you send packets of data uh, like through something like uh, UDP, TCP, et cetera, right? Like literally the networking layer itself. Um, And so maybe some history lessons here um, or historical context is in late 2021 to early 2022, Solana had the same problem with spam. And during NFT mints, right, that was the season, uh, people would just keep spamming mint buttons or bots to mint all the NFTs. Um, the, the block leaders would get overwhelmed. Okay, why does this happen on Solana and not Ethereum? Okay, that's probably uh, an interesting point to start from. On, on Ethereum, things go to the mempool, right? There's this pool, memory pool, where transactions go to. And if they're not valuable enough for somebody to include, maybe they'll expire or something. But they are included in that mempool, right? On so, and, and so there's like this discrete process of like you sending a transaction somewhere, it's staying there, and then somebody picking that transaction up and set of transactions and building a block, okay? On Solana, that's not the case. Solana does not have this discrete mechanism. Your transaction, instead of going to a mempool first, goes directly to the person producing the block or the validator pollution block. Uh, what that means is if you want a block included, or if you, tra- if you want your transaction to be included in the block, you tell the block leader directly, say, hey, here's my transaction. Okay, that is all fine during uh, regular markets, right? Like when there's the, 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 the demand for transactions doesn't exceed the available supply that the block leader has. Okay, now, if the demand outpaces the supply, the block leader is now, let's say the block leader can listen to a thousand people at the same time, right? But now there's a million people talking to the block leader at the same time. Okay, what is the block leader going to do then, right? 
because now there's so many people talking to uh, the validator, the block theater, that they are being overwhelmed. Okay, so Solana has this thing called Quick, which is a networking protocol, right? Uh, released by Google, I believe. And it, it, it sheds some connections or rate limits people based on certain criteria. I'm not going to get too technical here. Um, but basically, um, before that spam would actually bring down the block leader. The block leader would just be like, okay, I can handle this outage. Okay. That's how the outages would happen. Um, or some kind of downstream effects of that process. Now with quick, the block leaders can actually say, okay, you're not going to bring me down. I can just throttle you. Okay. But if the throttling mechanism isn't properly set, it'll throttle people that it's not supposed to throttle. Right. For example, if I'm sending you a transaction with a one dollar fee and then somebody else is sending you a transaction with a ten dollar fee in an efficient market or a proper mechanism, it should obviously prioritize the person paying more money. But since th there's a bunch of little mini contests or races happening and the network has a lot of randomness, that turns out to be extremely difficult to implement via code. Like it's a very difficult engineering problem to make that process more predictable. And so what ends up happening is since the block theory is getting spammed, it keeps dropping connections that it's not supposed to drop, right? And what that means for the user is that your voice just got cut. You need to try to speak to it again, okay? It's like a reporter, like a bunch of reporters trying to talk to like the same celebrity in like an interview situation, right? Uh, it's like, it can only take a certain amount of questions at a time. Um, okay, so that's a problem. Um, and so that's what happens. And um, th there's some like minor fixes around this, like for example, stake weight. So when we say stake weight, um, like stake weight QoS is what it's called. Um, the idea there is that uh, a staked connection has more of a voice that doesn't get pruned as much uh, as an unstaked voice, right? Like it's like a VIP list where you can actually uh, send more transactions to the leader. Now that process doesn't work perfectly either. If I'm being honest, uh, there's bugs there as well. Um, and so when, when, that's, that's what's happening, right? So if you're on phantom and you, you send a transaction, what, 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 what happens is the transaction is, uh, is signed by you. It then gets forward to the block leader and then also the next three block leaders. Okay. And that can be configured. And at each slot, which is the point at which a block leader, like the, the time window that is available to a block leader to produce a block, at each slot is expecting um, accepting all these transactions. And it can either just prune you directly, like it can just say, okay, shut up, like don't talk to me. Or it can try to include you every single time, but every single slot, it keeps forwarding it to the next block leader, right? Like if I can't um, uh, include your transaction in the slot, what I do is I forward to the next block leader and say, okay, you take care of this now, okay? But on, tra on Solana, transactions expire within a minute, okay? So if I keep doing this for a minute, your transaction is actually gonna expire fully. And so you need to retry again, okay? Um, and so it never actually makes it to the blockchain in that case. Uh, and by the way, if it doesn't make it to the blockchain, you cannot see it on any Dune chart. You can only see this from the point of view of a validator a validator's internal graphs, or like an RPC like us, like Helios. But you cannot see it on that failed transaction chart. That's a different thing altogether. Um, and so, yeah, that's the issue. And and so what that means is, so the TLDR is the networking stack is subpar. It is being reworked and there's patches coming to it. There's some bugs with it as well. Um, Firedancer has a new networking stack that they're also working on. And so now the question is, what are the set of changes required to fix that part of it? Now, 1.18 is coming, and 1.18 has some networking fixes. Um, and everybody thinks it'll fix the network because it has also something called a scheduler change. Um, basically, a scheduler is once it's past the networking stage, you can actually prioritize transactions based on uh, fees. But the, the current problem is actually something that happens before you even get to that stage. Okay. Um, so it's very hard to predict what happens in such a stochastic system with different dynamics, market conditions, and moving pieces until you actually ship it to production. Um, but the situation is certainly not great currently.
Um, you can get around this kind of with Jito because Jito has their own um, proprietary block engine. And I believe 50 to 60% of the validators on Solana actually uh, run Jito clients. And so you can do it through that way. Um, and, and that's fine, by the way. Um, w- one thing to be aware of, though, there is from a network perspective, then it's essentially kind of like a, um, like let's say uh, the, the the mempool, the discrete auction process brought back. And the end game of Solana is a continuous block building. So it is a very difficult set of engineering problems. Um, my co-founders and our engineers at Helios are trying to solve it the best we can. Uh, Anza is trying to solve it. Jiro's trying to solve it. Everybody's trying to solve it. Uh, but it is, it is a very difficult problem. That was a beautiful explanation, Mert. And uh, I have, so you mentioned, you pointed out all the problems with the networking layer. But now, uh, I think it was Trent on Twitter who started recirculating the points about you know, we kind of have a quirky solution with this stake weighted model. And at the end of the day, it's just an economic problem with the fee mechanism. This is kind of, I remember like Anatoly was bringing up this point of, hey, the fee model is broken. We got to do something. And then the response to that was, that's a band aid solution for the networking problem. And now it kind of feels like we're going in a circle of like, which piece is really the problem? Like, is the economic pro- problem here is that spam is still profitable and because spam is profitable there will be spam and because there is spam we're, we're experiencing these networking layers or these networking issues is that kind of like the flywheel we're de- dealing with here yeah I, I think it's difficult to point out exactly the source it is somewhat circular for sure and i think you could solve it via either i think that's kind of the, what what i would say without thinking too deeply about it uh, as, as my instinct. Uh, so like, for example, I think you could stop spam directly at the networking layer, or at least you could definitely control it in such a way to incentivize better block building. Okay. Um, I, I think that's also the same argument that fire dancer and like margin finance guys would make, which is that if you fix a networking stack, the economic problems are easier to manage and make more sense. But if you try to do the economics first and then the networking, then you're not necessarily solving this same set of problems. In 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 so that for example, if one ten had gone live, it's not clear if that would have actually fixed this because it's not clear if the uh, well, there's a bunch of reasons for why. But that's kind of the situation you start running into, which is are you even solving the right problem? Because is that problem going to be around once this new thing goes live? So. Um, I mean, like, of course, one thing you could just naively do is increase the fees. Okay. Such that, okay. Okay. But then why using Solana? Okay. Right. Right. Uh, then you could use any other. And, and by the way, I do think that if, if you were to raise fees today, that would certainly help spam, um, somewhat. Now I think that is also a bit more nuanced because it's actually like the, the, the question here isn't, okay, like the fees are like sub uh, one hundredths of a cent. And so let's just raise them to one cent. That's actually not, I don't think that's, that's, I think that's very naive because the actual equation is what is the expected value of spamming the chain? And is that greater than the cost, right? If the, if, if, if your expected value from an arbitrage trade is a million dollars, it does not matter what you make that fee throughout the course of the day. They're still going to spam if they think they can get more. Right. Um, so that, that, that's an interesting challenge. And, um, yeah, I, I think there's two camps on this, and it's probably pretty important that we start getting alignment soon. I, I do know that uh, Anza is working on pushing fixes to the networking stack. So clearly, they like I think the first problem or the biggest fire now is the networking stack. Okay, I think that needs to be solved regardless. Once you put that in a better spot, then I think you can start tweaking economics. Um, but I do think the biggest fire today is is quick, which is a networking layer. How many people in the world do you think fully understand the Solana networking stack today? Probably like 10, maybe. Yeah, that's I mean, like, uh, probably like 10 today, but like, I think, you know, you could probably train people to understand that right. not such a, like, it's just networking engineering is a pretty established field, but you need to now bring it into this context. Um, 
And I don't think the quick implementation that Solana currently has was accounted for massive increases in scale or some such adversarial conditions. Um, but it's certainly a very, very, very specialized. Uh, uh, and, and by the way, this is why I tell people to write and, and why we need more research on Solana so that this information that is only in the code base is, 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 is articulated and communicated to everybody else. So they have at least some sort of common ground to discuss ideas back and forth. Um, as opposed to like a few people just only understanding the code, it's just not going to scale, right? right? It might scale at first, but it's not going to scale as you keep growing and Solana is growing. Right. Yeah. I bring that up because, you know, we live in a world where the a world of a million chains is like a common discussion and launching new chains is fucking hard. And that's it's like whenever I think about this, you know, now you see the amount of teams that are dedicated to pushing this chain forward, Solana being that. Um, you know, we just talked about Anza, there's labs there, which spun out of labs, but um, you guys. I, again, I always go back to the guys at Umber Research from multiple different teams that are building their own products and then still focusing about some of Solana's core challenges. It is very hard to hit that critical mass of developers, um, both at the application layer and the core protocol layer. And if you don't get that, yeah, you can build a functioning chain. Like, you know, think about Solana in the early days. It worked until it started hitting scale and then it broke and then it fixed it. And then it kind of kept repeating that process until today where it's the continually has the highest TPS of any chain from like actual economic activity. And of course, you can debate the merits of that activity. But in my view, like what's happening on Solana with like meme coin trading and whatnot is just a fun. <laughs> that's not any different than the rest of the industry either. So um, one metric that always gets brought up in these times of uh, dropped transactions being a thing is is ping. So first part of the question is, can you explain what like network ping is? Um, I'll pull up a chart here while you're responding to, to kind of give the, the viewers a little bit more context here. Uh, so what is ping? And then the data that you're seeing at Helios, is that resembling some of the activity? Or are you seeing the drop transactions that like I can anecdotally say that I feel? Like, is that something you're seeing on the network again? Because um, it's hard to get good data on that. Um, so ping, the, the problem with this question is that I don't think the Explorer measures it the same way that like validators that app measures it. Um, Solana does have a C so for example, you're on validators that app right now. So if you, if you look at like Solana labs docs itself, uh, there's a CLI command called ping and basically you're submitting transactions sequentially, uh, and then you're measuring certain things about that transaction. Okay, so, um, uh, 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 look, for example, what is the time it took for it to be included in the block? And like, if you send, like, let's say 100 transactions over a span of 10 minutes, which percent of them were included in the block? And for those that did get included, what was the time that it took to include them? How much of that was just purely lost to the network, et cetera? So that's kind of what that represents. It's like, um, it's like, uh, 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 if you, Let's say you messaged your friend on Messenger or Telegram. Which one of those messages actually sent to them? And which one of them just got dropped due to horrible internet? Okay. Uh, and then the ones that you did send, how long do they take to get to the destination? That's kind of what it, 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 it represents. Um, now, the Explorer, I believe, the explore.salon.com, people uh, like to post that one on Twitter pretty frequently. The last time I checked, that one actually didn't even have priority fees, which means that it's actually giving a pretty bad representation of the chain that's not that accurate. And it also doesn't, um, it, it's, 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 it's very simplistic method. Now, it does give you some data, but it's simplistic. Uh, I don't remember how Valders that app here does it, but uh, I think this one's a bit more sophisticated. Um, and it, it has fees, and I believe it might use staked connections for some of them. Um, but basically, currently what's happened, and, and by the way, I test this myself. I, I have my own scripts and Helios has, we have our own dashboards internally to track which transactions are getting dropped and which are landing. Um, but yeah, like high level, that's what it represents. You send a transaction, does it get included? If it does, how long did it take? And then you sample that over some data set. Right. Okay. So that, that makes sense. And we can see here with this chart, um, you know, 4X increase in the response time over the last seven days. Um, 
which is interesting. I, I'm, I'm, it feels like the network activity hasn't totally changed over the last seven days. So sometimes I'm like wondering what has changed. Like even the... Um, so that's the thing. Um, the, the one deceivingly um, difficult thing about this is since most of the problems happen before they hit the network. Okay, so there's... Or maybe I'll replace the word network with the blockchain. Since most of the problems happen before they hit the blockchain, it is very difficult to understand the data that occurs before it even gets to that stage, right? Because that is something that only the validators themselves have access to, like literal packet data um, or like the number of reconnects that a quick server has or something. That is not something you can see on Dune or flip side, which makes this very hard to reason about. Yeah, definitely agree with that there. And, and the other thing you mentioned was Jito, um, which Jito, you know, we've talked about them quite a bit on, on the show just because they're now fairly ingrained in the uh, Solana core protocol with 72%, I believe the number is, uh, 72% of validators are running the Jito client. Uh, of course, when they turned off the mempool, we had a, a full discussion with John Charb on that. Uh, and they've actually surpassed the total amount of tips moving through the block engine, right? Because the mempool was shut off. Uh, and so that basically discontinued sandwich attacks and front running. Uh, but you can still send bundles of transactions through the block engine to be included in the blocks. And right now, Jito is uh, doing this quite well. Uh, Luke is uh, the, the founder and CEO actually tweeted out some stats and they're seeing 45% of transactions moving through the block engine are landing in the same slot and 90% are landing within five slots, um, which is about two seconds of latency. And that's you know quite impressive when you, you look out at what the rest of the the activity on the chain is having to deal with. Um, and now they're actually seeing like applications hook into the block engine and route through there. And fees are slightly higher if you're doing that, um, but not considerably. And it's definitely a, a worthwhile UX upgrade. But the question is like, once everyone starts doing that, it, then we're kind of back at square zero. We haven't really solved the problem. Um, what I'm super curious about and need to get my hands on the data to, to dig through this is like, are regular people just sophisticated individuals because you it is a challenge to just route a transaction through the Jito block engine like I, I'm not doing that um, are people sending bundles if you will of a single transaction through the block engine to like increase their odds of inclusion right because you can kind of remove some of these uh, issues you have and it's sort of like an out of payment out of network payment to the validator which we can dive into that conversation, but nonetheless, like this is a tool to get your transaction included. And I'm really, really curious if we've seen an increase in activity of people just saying, "Hey, I just want this transaction included, man," and I'm willing to pay pay slightly more. So let me send it through the block engine. I, I haven't looked at the data yet, but that's a it'd be an interesting to hypothesis just because we've seen, you know, all time highs of the amount of soul being paid from searchers to validators moving through the block engine. Yeah, it's. Um it's, it's, it's essentially some sort of an auction process, right? So um, I, I th currently the people who use it the most are going to be searchers, right? Um, and and, and uh, relatively more sophisticated folks. And I think there's some like a race condition here, which is like how fast is the networking stack get fixed relative to this? If it takes six months, I could see the Jito thing becoming very interesting. But then again, you run into the fee problem, which is like you can't get around the fee problem. The fee right. problem is such that like people are now going to be auctioning and bidding against each other for that. Uh, and then the base fees will, or not the base fees, but just the fees, uh, your expenses are going to go up. Okay. Um, but then if maybe uh, Anza fixes this in like two months, what does that look like? Uh, honestly, I have no idea. <laughs> uh, I, one thing is like, the, I, I think the one thing we should do, though, is wallets specifically um, should get like priority access in a sense, because that is the point of contact for users. Right. And so um, I, what I want to do is I want to work with wallets specifically to really ensure that their transactions are landing as consistently as possible. Um, and so that at least people have um, unsophisticated people, like just people who want to just play around. Uh, get a much better improved UX. So that'll be my focus. Um, 
And uh, in parallel, obviously, people are working on fixes. But yeah, the Jito thing is, you know, uh, they did a lot of um, a lot of work forking that client and then getting people to adopt uh, 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 their client and run it with X percent of stake on the network. Um, and uh, I, I think that's, you know, should be very interesting to see how that plays out. I think that's, um, um, I know some folks try to like, uh, try to like for not for Cheeto, but they try to also uh, so, some questionable people, let's say, uh, are, are trying to add mempools and in, 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 in private and do some weird stuff as well. But but um, I, I don't think they'll be able to compete with Cheeto. That's if I'm being frank. Yeah, it's uh, we need to get some better validator client statistics around who's using which client because I'm, I'm I know there are a couple. Uh, Mev enabled clients that are doing mempools that are have cropped up, and I don't know what the dominance of those are. I would imagine it's very low. Uh, but if you're a fringe validator just burning money, losing money to vote fees and and whatnot, like someone's gonna try to run this thing. And the question is how much adoption will get, which I I tend to agree with you. I mean, foundation delegations play a pretty important role in the Solana validator ecosystem, and I really don't think you would jeopardize get it if you were a delegated validator i don't i don't think you'd want to put that at risk interesting to raise I, I, though. I doubt so i mean i'm not sure how that program works but i doubt they would not delegate for that reason um i, I think don't know there's, there's a lot of there's a lot of social pressure forming on this thing of like if you're going to run the mev enabled client like i mean even anatoly's tweeted about it yeah no i i think it's pr- i would not want to do that Personally, I'm sure there's probably going to be a lot of, if that conversation were to happen, I think it'd be relatively heated, but I, I, I wouldn't want that. Um, but I think what you could do is like, um, you know, toxic flow protected endpoints um, and like aggregating to DEXs or whatever validators that don't do that. So I think there's more technical things that you could put in place that we just have not put in place on Solana before because we haven't had this problem. So now the question is how fast can the ecosystem move together uh, as, a, as, a, as a as a unit and execute on some of these problems? All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna back you in a corner and make you answer that question because it feels like there's been good fee- discussions around like what potential fee mechanisms would look like, but I don't think we've made any meaningful progress uh, around what that will look like. And uh, Eclipse, the SVM L2 uh, using Celestia for DA and canonical bridge contract canonical bridge contract on ethereum i believe it is um they are probably going to experiment with the fee mechanism but like you got to get the thing live on mainnet before you start messing around so there's and there's no other chains that run the svm that i can think of off the top of my head so that's not okay yep there you go but they're probably not messing around with the fees as i wouldn't imagine um so how quickly do you think we get a functioning fee uh, fee mechanism ideated and implemented. And I mean, the same thing on the networking stack. Is that kind of just like, maybe we do some small upgrades now, but basically wait for a fired answer? Well, um, I guess there's like two questions there, but for the fee mechanism question, it really depends on what you mean by functional. Um, like functional as in does it work or is it affordable or is it optimized, et cetera. Um, I do think um, I'm pretty sure that there have been pretty solid progress on the networking stack. Like uh, Firedancer actually already rewrote the networking stack, by the way. Uh, and um, we don't actually have to wait for Firedancer to go live to take stuff from that, by the way. So this is that, Frank- that's Frankendancer, right? Because that will use the the new networking stack plus the existing, uh, on, I guess it's now the Onza client. Yeah, I need to do a bit more homework into exactly what that means. But um, all I know, or not all I know, but one thing I know is that the networking stack, there, there actually is an alternative. Uh, and I think it, it, it's reason, like, or maybe the, the the safer claim to make here is that we don't have to wait for Firedancer to improve the networking stack. So that's, that's because that would take like until towards the end of this year, maybe early next year. So that's a very long time, but I don't, we, that's not the case. Um, 
Okay, and then once the networking stack is is is, is better, less less jittery, you have more uh, signal to derive insights from. Then you can analyze like, okay, what's happening here? Like, first of all, so for example, one thing uh, uh, that was noticed is um, it, these markets, these these meme coins, they're all separate markets, right? And what's interesting about the fact that they're all separate markets is that it doesn't matter if they're isolated fee markets um, because no, um, uh, uh, th there won't be any state hotspots, right? For example, imagine you have one big market and everybody's trying to get on that and then the fees for that market keep going up, but everybody else is normal or their fees are normal. Okay, the alternative to that is all the markets are spread across the blockchain and there is no one giant hotspot. Okay, if there is no giant hotspot or no, if there is no um, set of bigger hotspots, then you need to increase block space. Okay, so you can fit more of those in. But if that's not the case, then you need to make the multidimensional feed markets work better. So it actually depends on those like there's a few and, and and so that is downstream of actually fixing the networking stack to get better signal and reduce the randomness as much as possible. Okay, that that paints a paints a very clear picture. So basically the order of operations here is upgrade the networking stack to improve the the quality of the information we can gather of what people are doing and will want to do on chain in the future. Uh, and then based on that information, we can kind of derive a more efficient path forward, whether that be through both adding additional block space, which is already actively being discussed, um, as well as improving the fee mechanism, which there's a very, I, I kept that piece broad intentionally because of what that means uh, kind of depends on the other factors we just discussed. Okay. That yeah. makes sense. Yeah. And, uh, you know, pretty strong disclaimer here that um, I don't write code myself <laughs> currently, so I am not as close to the metal as uh, Anza, for example. And um, this is just what I think. And it's very likely that Jito thinks something else, Friday thinks something else, Anza thinks something else. Even my co-founders maybe think something else. So this is just my opinion. Um, I do think it's correct, but I, I don't think it's the only opinion. Perfect context as well. That's probably sums up the uh, the talk on Solana itself, but there's a ton of interesting hap things happening on the app layer. Um, I guess we'll start with uh, Ellipsis, uh, founded by Eugene Chen and his team. Uh, I've raised a round for, I think it was uh, led by Paradigm. Uh, yeah, raised $20 million Series A funding led by Paradigm. Uh, so they are the found the creators of Phoenix, or the, the core contributors to Phoenix Protocol, uh, which is a order book decks uh, and has really done a phenomenal job kind of bringing things on chain. Um, any, any thoughts on, on this raise, what they, what they're building uh, and what's, what's kind of next for the team? Yeah. I mean, it's this hyper competent team. Um, Eugene, who, who we've had on the show before um, and Jerry, who I'm pretty sure we all, yeah, we, we had Jerry on the show before as well for a DeFi panel. Um, fun. People don't know that Jerry actually invented compression on Solana. So, uh, you know, uh, what Drip uses and what Helium and Render, et cetera, use for minting mass amounts of NFTs. or And then now we're actually at, at Helios and Light Protocol. We're generalizing that to all state on Solana, not just NFT state. Um, he actually in, in invented that, so he's, he's hyper-competent. Uh, and then same with Eugene. There's a there's a picture that I showed sure around today of uh, Eugene shaking hands with uh, Obama uh, when, when he was younger because he's like a math genius uh, graduated MIT in like three years, et cetera. Uh, and then the rest of the team is also super uh, smart as well. Um, uh, they, they have an engineer, Rahul, they have good BD people. Um, so super solid team. I'm an investor. Um, and, uh, the, there, there's some funny memes like, uh, cause the cap table was quite diverse. Let's say it had a lot of people from, um, like it had me and some Kobe Ethereum foundation, Eigenlayer, and it's holy. So, uh, you know, very, uh, let's say DEY uh, cap table and uh, Doug, the founder of Ambient, uh, tweeted a picture of, uh, of a meme and it was uh, that scene of Lord of the Rings where it's like Gimli and Legolas and it's like, I never thought I'd, you know, fight alongside of an, uh, 
an elf or something. And then Legolas is like, how about a friend? And it's like me and Justin Drake on the same chat table. Um, yeah, so uh, hyper competent team. They obviously have an order book, Phoenix, on Solana. It's very capital efficient. That's kind of the whole thing there. Um, and uh, yeah, they. Uh, I'll let them disclose what they're building, of course. You know, the, the way these races work is they get announced like after they're actually done. So, for example, uh, from Helios's raise, um, when, when I was raising for my company, the market changed drastically and like we had to shift what we were doing or we didn't have to shift it, but we listened to the market. And so there's some interesting dynamics there. So I am really excited to see what they build. But all I know is that if you're going to watch somebody build something or like if, if you have fine attention, that is like one of the teams you need to watch because there's essentially nobody who understands Solana and the SVM as well as them in terms of ecosystem teams while also knowing uh, other ecosystems. Uh, and, and so uh, I, I think they're like the biggest, I don't say dark horses, people already know them, but like they have an immense amount of potential. So I'm excited to see what, what happens with that. Yeah, I mean, I think Dark Horse is fair. That was a very like respectable raise in in this climate where you're seeing some pretty absurd valuations get thrown around. Um, but strongly agree. I haven't had the pleasure of meeting Jerry yet, but I've spoken to Eugene a few times. You can just like feel the the intelligence radiating off the man. Um, <laughs> it's crazy. And you mentioned that picture you circulated around. I also saw a clip from him in one of those math competitions, and it's impressive to say the least. <laughs> Want to feel dumb yeah. real quick? Go find that video. Um, but yeah, and then another thing that launched on on the app layer for Solana, this one's a bit goofy, admittedly, but it is intriguing. And, and disclosure, I, I dabbled in this in this one, so I do own some ore. Uh, do not go buy this because I am talking about it. It's it's like a bit of a low cap one, so I genuinely even feel guilty talking about it. But they're doing something fairly unique, uh, and it's something that I poked around with the uh, the analysts on our team a while back in the day. So it's it's funny to see this thing come live. But ore is uh, launching or has launched, basically something that mimics Bitcoin, but in a smart contract. And they launched it on Solana. Um, and basically what this thing does is it targets to release one token called OR per minute. Uh, and that's bounded between zero and two. So this thing has a linear supply growth that targets 21 million tokens every 40 years. Uh, and there's no hard cap. It, it will always kind of keep this uh, growth sc- emission schedule alive. And it emits tokens to people that basically do some form of useful work, which, yes, this sounds a lot familiar to, to Bitcoin, right? So the, the the mechanism mimics Bitcoin proof of work with some slight tweaks where the miner or miners are solving computations for rewards. But instead of in Bitcoin proof of work where there's one equation that everybody is solving and the winner of that equation or the first one to complete it kind of gets the reward, the block reward, Anybody, every miner on the network has like a unique computation. And if you solve it, then you are eligible for rewards in that period. Uh, so it's like one small tweak. Uh, but again, this is still this, the same the same premise. So as long as a miner provides a valid solution to their own individual challenge, they're guaranteed a piece of, of that supply. Uh, the launch was was interesting. It was it's a pretty poor launch, if we're being completely honest. The the mining UI was broken, so to like actually go on the interface and, and interact and set up a miner was broken. The contracts had some budget, buggy logic, uh, such as like some basic things, such as like leaving off a zero for the uh, CU computational unit limit when you're trying to execute a transaction. Uh, the transaction retry logic was pretty poorly written, it seems like. Uh, and so the percentage of like successful transactions was like something very low. Uh, around like 18 or 20 percent uh and then when this thing launched there like weren't even liquidity pools set up so it was pretty much broken in in every facet of the way um but it kind of has persevered through that and in the last 24 hours it is the most the third most interacted with program on solana so it's followed right behind radium and the spl token accounts of people making new meme coins uh, and then or and then at fourth was jupiter so it's like right up there with the big dogs in terms of like transaction interaction. Uh, it's not like, by, and by any means, that's not like the most meaningful statistic, but it is interesting to kind of see people uh, interested in farming this thing, which we're in a weird spot with like this AI narrative where 
there's people who like have dedicated devices, like cheap laptops that they're only just like farming AI tokens. Like the, some of these Mac mini chips are being used for it. Um, and so people like already have these rigs set up and now there's kind of this like meme coin slash AI mining thing slash Bitcoin thing. Um, that is, is live on Solana. And again, I think this is pretty gimmicky, but it is kind of funny because they've effectively put Bitcoin in a smart contract. And like, I know that's going to really rile up the Bitcoin maxis. But one thing I've never had the pleasure of chatting with you with about is, uh, is Bitcoin. I'm curious to get your take on, on kind of like how you think about Bitcoin. Do you find it interesting? Do you find it valuable? Like, what are your views on Bitcoin? Sure. Yeah. Um, but before I get to that, also, um, yeah, the or thing, the, the one interesting part of it is that like the, it, it's proof of work, but pr- I, probably the actual proof of work is getting the transaction to land on Solana. So it's like, you, you know, a uh, very fun dynamic there. Uh, and um, one, one of the things I also wanted to quickly call out there is um, that, yeah, the launch, you know, uh, I, I don't think the dev uh, really anticipated that much demand. So that's a good problem to have. Uh, but but it actually highlights something that I, I talk about pretty frequently, which is that um, in in product market fit, the product does not matter as much as the market. Okay, if you ship something that people are interested in, they don't care if it's broken; they will keep trying to make it work uh, and just get it out. And then now he's fixing it uh, systematically because uh, he knows there's demand, and he can maybe even raise it. Like he can do a bunch of different things. Um, but so I thought that was a really good way to approach that. Yeah, it's also cool because people are just like, this really showed me people are just tinkering again and just like, hey, he was like, you know what would be really fucking cool is if I built this and probably threw it together in uh, a relatively short span of time. It was like, hell yeah, like I got this thing in prod. Like that's cool to me. I, I That's honestly one of the things that keeps me around. Yeah, definitely. That tinkering uh, ethos, which is like, you know, essentially how Silicon Valley started. I think that's like important to maintain. Uh, as opposed to, you know, just tinkering with how to make most money possible within the shortest span time of time possible. I think that's, that's a cool experiment. Um, would be cooler if Solana worked, but, you know, that's another topic. Um, Bitcoin. Yeah, I mean, I'm a fan. Uh, I actually went through phases here. Obviously, I think most people in crypto, when they first hear Bitcoin, like I think most people in crypto are in crypto because of Bitcoin to some regard at first. And I was like that as well. And then I, you know, obviously worked on Solana more, even on Ethereum, Polygon a, a bit as well. And then I was like, eh, Bitcoin is kind of stupid. Like it doesn't do anything. It's, it's a rock, whatever. Um, and then my thoughts on it evolved again. Um, and I, I, I like, tr- like I do like, I, I do like the, um, I like the, the, fact that it, it 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 is it is truly decentralized like um I, I honestly don't think anything else in crypto is decentralized like truly decentralized you know people talk about oh nation state attacks and like oh if solana got attacked or anything got attacked they could do this eh, i i don't think that's really the case i'm sorry um not not right now maybe one day but i think bitcoin is the one that could actually endure something like a catastrophic event personally uh, people might disagree with that, sure, but that's what I believe. Um, I think it is, um, I don't think it's like an inflation hedge, right? Like I, I do think um, a lot of people are, um, I think a lot of people, I, for example, like the Bitcoin maxis at the laser eyes, I despise those people. Um, I don't think it's an inflation hedge. I don't think it's money. I don't think it's like, whatever, all these things. I think it's an interesting thing to hold if you believe in kind of the ethos and culture of Bitcoin. I look at it as a meme coin, but like the most legit meme coin. That's how I look at it. So I like it. Uh, And also I like this new, uh, let's say, renaissance of folks building around Bitcoin, like the L2s and the ordinals and stuff. I think that's pretty cool. Like we had uh, Udi on the show and he was talking about that aspect of it as well. I think that's pretty sweet. Um, and, you know, there's some weird maxis who are like, oh, no, 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 like this is going to kill Bitcoin. It's like, dude, please. Um, like, just... Uh, so, so the TLDR is, I, I really like it as a, um, as, 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 as a cultural thing, as an ethos. Um, I like 
holding the coin, although I don't use it as like an inflation hedge or something like that, like no mid economic kind of uh, curving there. Um, and I also really like the the new approach with L2s and ordinals and the programmability aspect. So I think that has some merit. We're still super early in the space, so why not just let the experiment run and see where it goes? Yeah, no, that's all. That's all fair points. And yeah, you mentioned the inflation hedge thing, and it's funny because like the story has evolved so many times. Just like people in real time trying to figure out, like, all right, so we got this thing, predetermined monetary supply. That's that seems like a pretty good idea. The demand side of the equation is like sort of what's always missing. And uh, the one of our co-founders, Mike Capolito, has as always is the one harping about how this, these things are all probably just commodities at the L1 layer, uh, which is pretty interesting, meaning yeah, you're, you're, when the value is determined by nothing more than supply and demand, right? When you talk about valuing oil, like on the supply side, you're like, all right, how much is OPEC allowing us to pull out of the ground in the next 24 months? And what is like US air travel or global demand for you know ships and, and all of these things when you're trying to value where is the oil market going over the next 24 months? Um, it probably doesn't look too too different for for a lot of these L1 assets that are like sort of money, sort of not money, sort of a store of value, digital gold. Um, yeah, and somewhere in the middle. So it has been very interesting to watch the, the narrative develop uh, over time. And I don't think that's like malicious or anything. I, I genuinely think that's just people like figuring out what this thing is. I agree with you. The, the experimentation happening there around ordinals um, and L2s seems interesting, uh, but it's also like... I feel like I feel like it's we're already doing that and somewhere else, uh, right? Like Ethereum's kind of pioneering what L2s look like, and all right, in, in the next five years, if we get Bitcoin L2s, like I, I don't know, it feels like a, we. Have, I don't know. Sometimes I feel like the that we need some consolidation uh, in some regard of where we're building and what we're building, uh, just because I feel like people chasing all these rabbit holes is is definitely a net benefit, like right. I'm, I'm pro competition, absolutely, uh, but sometimes I feel like there's some wasted efforts, and I, I'm not convinced that that's not what's happening with like ordinals. Like they're just shittier NFTs, uh, like at ordinals today. I don't know what ordinals tomorrow will look like, but that's sort of where they're at. Um, so I don't know. And net net, I'm, I'm definitely a fan of Bitcoin, but kind of in my, I, I'm in. It comes in waves, and I'm at the, I'm in a skeptical era with my love relationship with Bitcoin. Yeah, I think the let's say proponents look at it as sort of, you know, high value block space or luxury block space or I mean I personally like those terms, but that's kind of the counter argument there. And, you know, if you have very high value NFTs or something, then you would maybe store them on Bitcoin is kind of that seems I to hate be- that argument though. Like so I was talking to somebody about Ethereum the other day and like what activity will remain on L1. And that was the pitch was like, oh, well, if you're sending a high value transaction, it's going to happen on the L1. I'm like, that doesn't add up to me at all. That The high value transactions will follow activity. If every if the MakerDAO and all these other apps leave the L1 to go sit on L2s, wherever those apps are, where the high value transactions will be, mm-hmm. in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, I... Um- I'm not sure if I know who you're talking about, but I know there's one particular gentleman that I don't like on Twitter who keeps making that argument. And my answer is kind of like, but I thought you said L2s were supposed to be as decentralized and as possible and secure and whatever. So how come all the high value things should be happening on the L1? I don't, I don't think it makes sense either. Um, unless you're literally just an L1, like an integrated L1 like Solana. Um, so yeah, I'm, um, you know, uh, I, 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 again, the, the way I use Bitcoin is as a main point. Um, just because I think it, it, it represents, you're, you're kind of buying things that are based on other people's attention, I would say, in, in a sense. That's how I use it personally. Maybe it's not the correct way, but I don't really care. Um, I do use Solana, though, for on-chain purposes. And so, therefore, I use Solana and I buy Solana. And that's, that's why, because I actually need it. Um, so... Yeah, well, we, what we should do is we should get... Uh, oh, actually, by the way, we had Nick Carter on the show as well before and Udi. So if you're interested in Bitcoin-related stuff, they were both on before. Um, and maybe you, me and you should both watch some Michael Saylor videos and try to get him to sell <laughs> sell us. Because um, I like it, but I just... I can't like... Um, I can't really see why it would be the biggest thing in 20 years, for example. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's a fair take. That's a fair take. 
Uh, I saw someone dunking on Sailor the other day, and then I just pulled up the the Sailor tracker. Dude, <laughs> dude's up like $6 billion. I'm like, it doesn't matter what the fuck happens. You can't talk shit about this guy. This is not possible. But Mert, another great episode, man. Uh, thanks, everyone, for listening. We just released an episode with Jesse from Base as well, so be sure to check that one out. Uh, we do talk a lot of smack about L2s, but Jesse is one of the, the smartest minds in the space and honestly a super invigorating and in, in, inspiring person to listen to definitely check that episode out um and we will be back next week with another roundup and another interview awesome cheers everyone 